Hello. Can you all hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, is it clear? I'm making a different echo. So I just check. Sir, your voice is quite low. Okay. Uh, just give me a second. I just. How is it now? Is it bad or better or? Much better. Better, sir. Better. Okay. So I am not using any headphone now. So looks like the system's desktop audio is good enough. Okay, if there is any noise, let me know. I'll have to change. Okay. No, sir, it's fine. Okay. So we so what the what happened is that uh, this week nine session, sorry, week nine deadline is not going to change. So it means uh, week nine deadline is tomorrow. Tomorrow, twenty-three fifty-nine. Okay, so that is the news that we have. So you have to somehow manage the graded assignment by. You have to complete the graded assignment by tomorrow. So the reason is the first nine weeks are uh, the GS course of the first nine weeks. They count towards eligibility, right, to for the end term. So that eligibility computation, we have to complete it fast. So there is no extension possible. So somehow try to. Uh, excuse me, sir. So sometimes so normally you give at least extension on Friday at least. At least on Friday, if two days of extension also we get, we get sometimes. Yeah, I I understand, but I don't think this time it's happening. That's the decision that has been taken. So unfortunately, the more you have to try and. Wait before that. Now the problem is there is a lot of workload. Then we have to do all the sessions and then all the correct, assignments correct, yeah. also. So I I understand, but uh, see, I this is not something I alone can do, right? So I have to. It's like uh, across the foundational level, the decision they have taken. So, um, yeah, we'll see if some. If any, but at least it's Friday, sir, because. Uh, Yeah, you don't want maybe not if possible then not maybe next Wednesday but at least till Friday normally it is given for every quiz. Correct. Yeah, usually it happens, but somehow this time it looks like it won't happen. So I am just giving you it's a if something else happens, I can we'll send out an announcement. But yeah, currently so this is how it so is. But in that case, then no two two instructor sessions will also get not get completed. Yeah, yeah. So one session will happen tomorrow, but yeah, you know, understand that it's too late to do anything. Yeah, anyway, let's see, right? So let's complete today's session. I'll, we'll see what can be done. Okay. Okay. Sir. Okay. So we'll start with uh, week nine. So week nine is a departure from linear algebra. So linear algebra is done for max two. Okay. So, So that is depending on whether you like linear linear algebra or not. That is either good news or bad news. So you will meet linear algebra again in MLF. Okay. So until then, of course, it is there for end term exam, but at least for some time you can be free of the subject. So we now move into calculus territory. So we have already seen a single variable calculus right so functions of one variable so you have seen that in max 1 okay so you know how to take the limit of function yeah uh, what will be the weightage of 8 weeks in the end term that will be considerable it's not uh, negligible so it will be like quite a few marks will come from that right so you have to know all 8 we all 12 weeks so Skipping linear algebra is not an option for the end term. Okay, so yeah, so we have already seen functions of one variable. So what we'll do is uh, very quickly we'll go go over some of the concepts that we have seen in uh, Max One. Okay, so the first is the limit of a function or limit of a sequence. So you must be familiar with the idea of a sequence, right? So say x n equal to One over n is a sequence, right? So the sequence will be what? It will be uh, numbers of this form, right? So one, 
comma half comma one by three right so dot 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 we'll keep going on and uh, moment you have a sequence it makes sense to ask what is the limit of the sequence right so limit as n tends to infinity of xn so as it n becomes larger and larger to what value does the sequence uh, tend to right so what is the answer for this two so zero right yeah. yes sir. So as Some n becomes are... large uh, one by n tends to zero now this is a limit of a sequence but usually we are more interested in limits of functions okay so i'm not going into any formal definition i'm just looking at what is needed for this particular week okay so we can extend this idea to limits of functions right so for uh, let's say x tends to 0 you have x square minus 2x plus 3 okay so as x approaches 0 what happens to the value of this function so in this three. case uh, the value is 3 right so this is uh, one example maybe one final example which is something we'll use in uh, this particular week and also in subsequent weeks is this common limit uh, which you must again know sine x by x right as x tends to zero what happens to sine x by x it's tends to one sir one right so one. the limit extending to zero sine x by x is one so uh, more than this you might have also seen the z power x minus one by x that is also there but then uh, few other limits you may have to know but more more than the, these two special limits you don't have to know anything extra right so e power x minus 1 by x sin x by x that should be enough as far as uh, special limits are concerned okay so special limits by special limits i mean non obvious limits right so here it's obvious polynomial it's a polynomial function right so polynomial functions are well behaved so they don't enter into difficulties that some other functions have right so you can just substitute the value of zero and you'll get the limit right so that is uh, one advantage of well-behaved functions like polynomials or exponential functions e power x e power x for example you can just plug in the value of uh, x and uh, whatever the extending to a means e power a right that will be the limit so these are basics of limits that you must be aware of now very quickly let's also look at uh, continuity now when do you say that a function is uh, continuous when, uh, when there's a no break in the graph our pencil like it's continuous and we don't have to look our pencil or drawing equipment okay so that's when the there is no breaks in the intuitive in the idea of limit so so when left hmm. limit equal to right limit equal to function value at that point right okay so lhl the left hand limit equal to the right hand limit equal to the functions value at that point right so basically what are we saying the limit should exist okay and it should be equal to value of the function at that point right so we say that a function f is uh, function f is continuous uh, at say the point x equal to a if the limit at uh, not zero so x equal to a so if limit at x equal to a exists okay that means for this to exist as one of you pointed out the left hand limit and the right hand limit should be the same right only then you you even have a limit and the second condition is that f of x f of a should be equal to l right so let's call this l so if this is l then the value of the function at the point should be equal to the limit so if this happens then the function is continuous so let's uh, let's quickly look at uh, an example of a function that is not continuous that will be easier so i'll use geogebra and uh, this alternatively right? so, so I'll, I'll alternate between uh, geogebra and this one so let's look at let's say f of x equal to say mod x by x okay so mod x by x is a common function the sine function so what is mod x by x let me hide this 
okay so mod x by x is the definition of the function when x is not equal to 0 and when x equal to 0 let's say it is 0 so what is the right hand limit for this function 1 1, one, one. Right? so you must so at x equal to 0 right hand limit is 1 at x equal to 0 the left hand limit is Minus, minus, one. minus one and the value of the function is zero so we don't even need to go till the value of the function the limit does not exist so there's no question of asking what the function's value is so this is one example of a discontinuous function right so example of a discontinuous function would be the following right so this is defined piecewise again this is uh, this is something you might have seen piecewise definition so this is one when x is greater than zero and uh, let's say we define it to be zero when x equal to zero and minus one when x less than zero so this is a discontinuous function okay now most of the functions that we would like to work with we expect them to be continuous right so we typically even though there are functions like this right which we have constructed manually the functions that we are used to right? like sine trigonometric functions or uh, exponential functions all these things that come up in uh, real life applications it, it's it's convenient to work with continuous functions like those okay so that is uh, one point and finally we come to differentiability now let's first uh, define what is the derivative of a function f of x at x equal to a so let's let's try to understand what this means so what is the def derivative of a function at x equal to a what does it mean f dash of a okay f dash of a so geometrically what does it mean and algebraically what does it how do you express it it is a sharp end geometrically sharp point mm. sir it is a tangent to that function at that point okay Okay, it is the tangent to a slope, function at a point. Slope. Yeah, it is the slope of the tangent to a function at a point, right? So let's uh, quickly look at, let's say, this uh, function. Mm. It's... Okay, so let's look at, say, y equal to x square. Okay, now let me turn on the grid. grid is there so i have to turn on the axis okay so right so this is y equal to x square now let's take a point let's say the point one comma one okay one comma one is a point on the function okay so x equal to one y equal to one now let's uh, construct the tangent to this curve so tangent what is a tangent to a curve it does it just touches, touches the, curve the point. Point. yeah it, it touches, touches the curve at just that point right so this is this is a tangent now you 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 may also recall a line so so this is what this secant. is what okay secant. that's a secant right so that's a secant we call it a secant and uh, so when when you when when this if you, if you can think of uh, so the, the one definition is there. So if B and C are points on the curve, then you have a secant, right? So if you keep bringing the secant, if, if you keep bringing the two points close to close together, right? So then the secant, secant at the point will, so secant will approach the tangent at that point, right? So this is one of the ways of geometrically defining it. Of course, I'm doing a bad job of illustrating it, but then I hope you get the point, right? So you have B, and then if you keep bringing C closer to B, at the in in the limit, it will become the tangent at B. Okay, so I hope that visual is clear. But what we want now is uh, this particular tangent. So the the tangent. Once you draw the tangent, the tangent will have a slope. So what what do you think is the slope here of the tangent? F to six. It's the slope of the line. Correct. One. Yeah. What's the slope of this line. 
1.5 yeah 1 one over 0.5 right so we expect that to be what 1 over so that 2 so we expect the slope of the tangent at the point to be 2 so this is exactly what f dash of 1 will give us right so so if you have f of x so i'll just take f of x equal to x square now we all know that uh, f dash of x is 2x 2x okay and uh, from this we know that f of f f prime of uh, f dash of 1 is 2 okay so what does this f dash of 1 give you it gives you the slope of the tangent to that point okay so the slope of the tangent to that point so the, the derivative is not the tangent but then it's closely related to the tangent right so it it gives you the slope of the tangent at that point to that curve right so that is the idea of a derivative as you should know all these are things that i'm assuming you already know and i'm proceeding okay so this is computationally what happens and so geometrically also this is what happens formally let's define it because you need to be aware of this so this is nothing but a ratio so you want to find the derivative at x equal to a so you just take f of a okay this is the value of the point at a and then slightly move to the right or left of a so that is f of a plus h okay so recall that we were talking about the secant right so you have two points very close to each other one is a another one is a plus h okay so this h can be positive or negative depending on how the function looks this will either you know go up the function or go down the function okay or it will stay stay flat so that depends on the function but this is the vertical distance are you all able to see that it's on the y axis this is measured on the y axis Okay, now on the x-axis, what do we have? What is the difference going to be? A plus h minus a. a. Correct, right? So a plus h minus a, which is just h. Okay, so this is a ratio. Okay, this is also called the rate of change of f at a, right? What, what do we mean by that? How fast is f changing? as you change x okay so as you keep changing x so if you change x by a small a small distance so h h is the amount by which you are changing the x coordinate so that therefore it becomes a plus h and the difference is a plus h minus a right that is how much you are changing the x coordinate by how much does the function's value change so the function's value will change by f of a plus h minus f of a okay so now this is how much change there is for some h now if you keep making h small okay smaller and smaller in the limit what happens to this ratio that is what we call f prime of a okay so the another, another notation you might be aware of is uh, df by dx at the point a okay so is this definition uh, do you recall this definition of a derivative yes sir okay so this is uh, the algebraic definition now geometrically it is the f prime of a is the slope of the tangent to the curve what is the curve? The curve is actually x comma f of x, right? You are plotting x on the x-axis, f of x on the y-axis. So the set of all these points, that is what we are calling the curve, right? So the curve for f of x equal to x square is called what? A parabola, right? So whatever we just saw, that's called a parabola, right? So f of x equal to x square, that is a curve. Whatever you draw is a curve. Now, the if you draw a tangent to the curve, at a comma f of a it will have some slope right it's a line tangent is a line so if you draw the tangent to this curve at a comma f of a that will have a slope the the grade the derivative measures the 
slope of this tangent. Okay, so I hope this is clear. Any questions in, in regarding this derivative part? Sir, but in x square, uh, the curve in x square, if we take a negative point, the slope should be also negative, right? Because the uh, that tangent line is also in a negative direction. Correct. Yeah, it will be negative, no? So f dash of minus one will be minus two. So it will be negative, no? Slope will be. Oh yeah, yeah, it will be negative. Yes, sir. Sir, for this week, we just need uh, the basic concepts of calculus, or we need to revise like every formula which was there in the maths. Uh, no, just the basics of calculus uh, plus. So you need to know how to take derivatives of simple functions like sine x, trigonometric functions, e power x, ln x. Like all the concepts would be okay, right? Not all the formula of every derivative. Like... Not necessary. Not necessary. So see some of the rules you need to know. So since we are in the differentiability part, let's uh, look at two of the common rules, right? One is this UV rule or the product rule, right? So product rule and rule. rule. Right. Yeah, so this is something we need to know. So let's let's quickly discuss that. that. Is subtraction rule. Uh, so this is f f g prime is what? F dash of g plus yeah, f dash g plus uh, plus f, f of g dash. Right. So maybe I'll just uh, I'll make properly right so f of x and g of x if you multiply and if you take the derivative of the product that is just uh, f prime of x g of x plus f of x uh, g prime of x right so this is the product rule and you also have the quotient rule right so yes now what will this be f of x by g of x if you take the quotient this is the quotient now you take the derivative of this function resulting function it is what so there's a g of x square right in the denominator yes okay now what will be the numerator the same product rule one in uh, and uh, with the minus sign right? okay so denominator f prime of x minus numerator g prime of x is this correct yes v this is the quotient rule, right? So g of x into f prime of x minus f of x g prime of x by g of x whole square. So this is the product, uh, sorry, quotient rule. And then you have the chain rule, right? That is also needed for this week. Now, if you have something of the form f of g of x, so what will you do? How will you write this? Say, so if the symbols are confusing, f let's say this is, of x. Uh, what is it? Can you tell me? F, f dash, then g of x dot g dash x. OK, right. So this is the chain rule. OK, these these are important. So let, let's we'll do examples of product and quotient chain rule. All of them will. So they'll automatically turn up when we discuss multivariable functions, right? So you need to revise all this. So product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, and then uh, limits, not many. You just need to know sine x by x and maybe e power x minus 1 by x. Those two are enough. Continuity, there is nothing much to revise. So if you know the definition, that is enough. Sir? Yeah. And do we need the L'Hopital rule as well? Uh, not really. So we won't. I at least I re I don't recall using it that much in this uh, week nine of max two. Right, okay. so you may not need. Okay, so that is uh, recap. Now, now it is only now that we get to multivariable functions. So there are two kinds that you have to know. One is called scalar valued multivariable functions. Right, so these are first of all. What do we mean by multivariable functions? It it means there are multiple variables, right? So all the functions you have seen so far are functions of one variable. So it's like f of x or f of y, right? So there's only one variable, one input, one output, right? So yeah. 
So L'Hopital's rule is this only, right? Limit of x tends to h. F a plus f of a plus h minus f of a by h. No, oh, that is the derivative derivatives definition, right? Uh, so once again, so single input and single output. So these are functions of one variable. So what is the L'Hopital rule? So when we get zero by zero, if a function a, is it zero by zero or infinity by infinity, then we differentiate at each step and check for the form at each okay, step. So if you have functions of, uh, okay, I am slightly rusty when it comes to the L'Hopital rule. So if you have, say, functions of this form, which are either of this in so two two kinds of indeterminate forms so it could be either zero by zero or it could be infinity by sorry infinity by infinity okay so there are some qualifiers so in such cases um so limit extending to a so i don't remember so let's just say this is limit extending to a f of x by g of x assuming that this is of one of these forms this is the same as Derivative uh, of uh, numerator and denominator, right? Separately. Okay, so I recall till the derivative part. Is it a limit of this co quotient or is it just the quotient? Limit of x into a. Okay, so I think there is one more qualifier provided uh, the numerator and denominator here. Those limits exist, right? There is some qualifier here. I don't recall. Sir, except at that point, uh, we have to find at that point A where it is uh, indeterminate. Uh, at that point, we have to find the uh, dash x and g dash x and then uh, divide. Okay, okay. So, one second. So, I don't want to do something incorrect uh, in the session. So, let's refer our good old Wikipedia. So, what is it? Say, Hopital rule. L hope it, so I told I, I wrote it as hospital rule so it's L'Hopital so S is remote okay F and G which are differentiable so limit is zero or plus or minus infinity and G dash of x not equal to zero okay right so what I'll do is safely I'll copy this instead of making any mistakes okay so let for safety purposes, uh, know this also, but I, I don't think you'll be using it anywhere. L'Hopital rule. Okay. Yeah, so can we move on to multivariable functions now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, Yeah, so multivariable functions are, uh, yeah, so as we have seen, they are slightly different. So you have one, so two or more inputs and two or more. So it need not have two or more outputs, one or more outputs. Okay, so that's what uh, multivariable functions are going to be. So when you have exactly one output, one real value, uh, so some real number is the output, then we call them scalar valued multivariable functions, right? So this, for example, so f of x comma y is x plus y. So this is a multivariable function because there are two inputs and it's a scalar valued multivariable function because it has only one output, right? It maps to some real number. Okay, so these are, you could also call them real valued functions in this case because uh, domain is real number yeah the codomain is real so in our course we don't deal with complex numbers so it's okay to call them real valued functions also one more example right so this is from r3 to r and some function right these are scalar valued multivariable functions now you could also have vector valued multivariable functions such as this so this is a vector, right? So this is some vector in R2. The, the input is having multiple variables. So it's multivariable. And the output is having 
multiple components therefore it is a vector valued multivariable function okay in fact we are used to this can you tell me what kind of a function f is linear transformation exactly right what so is a good old linear transformation which we have been studying so far so many of the linear transformations we have seen are vector valued multivariable functions which additionally had this linearity property okay of course there was the vector space stru structure on r4 r3 all that was there but if you purely look at them as functions they are vector valued multivariable functions okay so that is that is all you need to know about what uh, multivariable functions are so most of the times we will be dealing with scalar valued multivariable functions because they are very useful functions to work with okay now there are of course applications in machine learning and other courses where we look at uh, functions of multiple variables which will map to a single number okay so these are very useful so most of our attention will be devoted to scalar valued multivariable functions okay but you must also know this but in terms of in importance the first one gets more importance okay so that is regarding uh, vector uh, sorry uh, multivariable function so now let's get started with partial derivatives right so we know what a derivative is okay so it's the tangent at a point slope of the tangent at a point for a single variable functions f dash of x is df by dx it is also the rate of change of f how much touch how much how much does the function change when you change x by a small amount okay so that is what the deriv derivative is for a single variable function so now we have to look at the concept of extending the derivative to functions of multiple variables okay so to begin with let's not worry about too many variables let's have just two variables x comma y okay what does f of x comma y look like first before even we talk about derivatives let's look at uh, f of x comma y what it looks like so it's uh, easier to visualize simple functions like this only we'll do that so this is x square plus y square right so this is how it looks like now let me reposition this so that yeah right so this is, i hope you are able to visualize this what so if you if you think about it often called i think it's a parabola like a so is it a paraboloid paraboloid yeah so it's uh, if you Your take a parabola is. right you think about a parabola so it's the x y is here right i, I hope you can see x axis here and the, the red one is the x-axis, green one is the y-axis. Now, the z-axis is the blue one pointing above. So if you take a parabola and then you rotate it, the, the surface formed in that process is a parabola. Okay, so so parabola of revolution. So you just keep revolving the parabola. You will end up with this parabola. Okay, so I hope you are all able to visualize this and picture this in your head. Okay. But why is it coming up means why it is taking values in z-axis? Because the function has, the domain is the plane, xy plane, right? Any point on the gray color plane that you see here is a point in the domain of the function. Okay, for example, let's, uh, let's take the point 1 comma 1, right? So A, so, sorry, this. Let's take one comma one, and I think we can fix it here. So, okay, right? I fixed this point. So, if you notice, one comma one is a point on the plane x y plane. Now, the value of the function at this point is going to be what? What is the value of the function going to be? Two, two right? Two. This will be. Hmm, so one comma one comma two, right? So. If you notice, okay, this is, you have to make this big enough to see that. So what I'll do is I'll take a point which is closer to, 
uh, right yeah i'll take 0.5 comma 0.5 so this is 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 and it becomes what 0.5 0.5 0.5 right okay so notice that this i hope you are able to see this right so this a on the a is a point in the domain of the function f which is in the xy plane and uh, this point the value of the function corresponding to it is is actually a scalar valued function right so the the value is a scalar the output is a scalar in this case it is 0.5 but then if you draw x comma y comma f of x comma y that will be a surface okay this is called a surface so the point lies on this surface okay is that part is that part clear yes sir okay so if you now go back the graph okay or, or the collection of all the points of the form x comma y comma f of x comma y forms a surface in r3 okay so this is a two variable function it's a scalar function so it's a scalar valued function of multiple variables in this case two variables if you take the collection of all the points of the form x comma y comma f of x comma y that will form a surface in r3 and that surface is what you just saw right so this is uh, this is how the function looks like now we have to ask this question if we move a small distance along some direction how will the function change right so the idea of derivative remains the same the derivative is rate of change of function okay but then let's go back to this uh, this diagram right so or this plot now notice that there are multiple directions in which you can move okay this is the crux of the not just week nine but all of multivariable calculus so I'll, I'll go back to i'll keep moving between these three tabs see notice that you here you have the point one right so you you are trying to find out the derivative of x square at the point one now, what 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 did we just uh, talk about? So, if you move a small distance on the left or to the right of one, by how much does the function change? Do you all get this idea? This of the der der derivative for a single variable function. Yes, sir. Right. So here, notice the important point: you can only move in the left or right direction. You can only move either to the left of the point one or to the right of the point one there are no other directions to move in the domain okay so the domain is the x-axis the x-axis is single dimensional domain right so you can only move left or right there's no question of moving up moving down because those these these are not points in the domain right domain is only the horizontal line here so if you want to talk about the rate of change of a function you only can talk about moving towards the left or moving towards the right Whereas when you come to a multivariable function, if you take the point A, now look at the domain. The domain is the plane, the gray color plane here. So you can move in infinitely many directions. Right? So for example, I can move in. Let's see if we have a tool for this. Mm. So, so we can to... the entire xy plane and look for its value in that uh, uh, right yeah so i i instead of drawing this i'll just ask you if you are able to follow this so at the point a i can from a i can move north i can move south i can move east i can move west i can move northwest i can move southwest and any of the other in any of the other directions i can move so do you all get yeah. this idea basically we can complete a circle yeah so any one of the 360 degree directions you can move from point a so do you see the difficulty in computing the derivative or extending yeah. the idea of the derivative yes yes sir. okay so you can't just say that i will only move along some direction and that will be the derivative right but that's all we know from single variable calculus 
So the partial derivative is actually a, it's an attempt to answer this question. So I'm going to forget about all other directions and I'm only going to focus on two directions, the X direction and Y direction. Okay, so what we do is we fix the value of Y. Okay, so red color is the X axis, right? So let's focus on X axis. I'm going to fix the value of Y, meaning I'm going to draw this Y equal to, so I'm at the point 0 0.5, right? I'm going to draw this plane Y equal to 0.5. Do you all see that Y equal to 0.5 is a plane? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. so I'm going to draw yes. this plane. Now, and what I'll do is I'll restrict this. I'll see where this plane intersects the, the paraboloid, right? So this surface. So this plane intersects this surface in a curve like this. Okay, so this uh, solid black color curve is where this plane intersects this curve, right? Now, along this curve, what can you tell me about the y value of the function? y remains fixed and x changes. Okay, y remains constant. Okay, y remains constant at 0.5 and x changes, right? So if you now go back, what we have managed to do is we have managed to convert a multivariable function into single variable. single variable function in terms of x. OK, so this is the transition that we have made. So what is the single variable function going to look like? It will look like, say, some g of x equal to x square plus 0.5. x square plus 0.25. x square plus 0.25. OK, so that's how this function so this black color curve that you see here, the black color curve that you see here is actually the function x square plus 0.25. So do you all agree that this is what we have managed to do so far? Yes, sir. OK, yes, sir. now what happens is now I have a function of a, of a single variable, right? I have a single variable function. Therefore, I can talk about rate of change using my old definition. So along this plane, right, or along this curve, I know what the derivative is. OK, I can draw a tangent. I can measure its slope. That will be the derivative. OK, so that's what we are going to do. And this, this derivative is called the partial derivative along the x axis or the x direction. OK, so this is defined as follows. So, so if you, you take this particular example, you will find g prime of x, OK? That will be 2x, OK? And uh, this is what we call the partial derivative of x at the point x comma 0 0.5. 0 0.5, right? So in fact, you can, in this case, you can get rid of the 0.5, but it's not the right thing to do. So we'll, we'll have x comma 0.5. This is, is, sorry? We can say a now, sir, at that point, 0 0.5. Uh, yeah, so you can actually, in this case, y doesn't feature anywhere here because it, it's, it gets uh, knocked out, but still. So is the idea of a partial derivative clear? Yes, sir. So that subscript x uh, means that uh, the x is changing and the other variables are fixed. Exactly, yeah. So it means that you are looking at the function, functions, uh, behavior along the x-axis while keeping the value of y fixed. OK, sir. OK, so the let's look at the proper way to write this down. Now, sir, can you please explain how y equals to 0 0.5 was making? Uh, can you repeat that? Why, how y what? equal to? 0 0.5 was making a plane. Was making a, sorry, not getting plane, that. Plane, sir. Ah, OK. So, y equal to 0.5 makes a plane because uh, once you fix y, x and z can take any value, right? It's actually the okay, x, okay. z plane. So it's 3ds. Okay, yeah. so, okay, so we are looking at plane shifted by 0.5. We can think of it. Ah, right, yeah. x, z plane shifted, yeah, correct. Okay, the notation for this is, for partial derivative is del f by del x. We call this del f by del x. 
So it's not df by dx because df by dx will be in some sense the total derivative, right? We are not calculating the total derivative. We are only looking at partial derivative. We are fixing y. We are not moving y. We are we are looking at the function as a we are fixing y and therefore it becomes a function of x. So it's a partial derivative. So this is let's say you, are, you want to compute it at a point a. Now what you have done is the following, right? So you have you have fixed the value of y. Uh, sorry, this will be at a point a comma b. Okay, so we are let's assume we are only de dealing with this this function, right? Two two multivariable function, but two variables. So this is f of a plus h, right? Remember that b b is fixed y equal to b is fixed but then h along the x-axis we are varying the function so this is a small movement along the x-axis now the original point is a comma b okay and the movement along the x-axis is h this is the movement along the z-axis if you can think about it okay so i'll go back now so i'll, I'll share two tabs now Sorry, I'll first share this tab. Okay, so what have we done? This is the red color is x-axis. This is y-axis. Now I'm I want to know the partial rate of change of the function along the x-axis, right? At the point, point 0.5 comma point 0.5. So what I do is I fix the value of y at point 0.5. So that gives me a plane that slices this curve, the surface at this parabola right this is actually a parabola now this parabola is in which which axis which plane is it lying in xz plane xz plane right so it's lying in the xz plane so you have to now come back to the 2d version so this is how it looks like so this is the x-axis this is the z-axis and now you are justified in talking about derivatives that is exactly what we are doing in in this case right so we are talking about the xz plane and we are looking at a small movement along the x-axis how much will the z value change it will change by this numerator whatever value is in the numerator is the change in the z value okay so this this is what we call the partial derivative of f with respect to x at the point a comma b okay is this idea clear yes sir okay so after doing all this, there's a very simple way to compute the partial derivatives for most functions which are well behaved. So for this function, right, what you do if you want to compute f x of say a comma b is, is to keep y constant. Okay, so I'll just replace this by x comma y in general. So keep y constant and treat this as a function of x, right? So let me write that down to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to x keep y constant and differentiate the function with respect to x that will give you the partial derivative so if you keep y constant what is the derivative of uh, x square plus y square with respect to x 2x 2x right so the y disappears because that is fixed right Constant. remember you are slicing the plane and then you are fixing y to be 0.5 therefore y is fixed okay so this is called f fx now you can do something very similar for y so the partial derivative of f with respect to y what you do is you keep x constant and differentiate with respect to y okay so and you call this f underscore y or f subscript y and uh, this will be what for this function 2y Two 2y Two right so that is all there is to the idea of partial derivatives so okay, you can know it, it as like uh, as y is constant its uh, derivative is zero yeah, yeah right it, it won't so in this case y square will not 
here derivative of y square is 0 with respect to x because we are fixing y to some constant value. Yes. OK, so that is the idea. Now, what you can so do is uh, is explain again how the uh, changes of x is affecting z axis. Because you have the z axis is the value of the function, right? So as you move along the x axis, so you'll move along the x axis along this plane, right? So y equal to 0.5 is this plane, and x can move from minus infinity to infinity as you move along this plane. Okay, okay, the, okay, sir, so understood, understood. Yeah, so the z will keep changing. Okay, so that is uh, that is the idea. Now you have to compute fx and fy for some other function. So now it becomes just a matter of applying what you have learned in max one. So if you want to know what the partial derivative with respect to x is, you have to keep you have to fix y as some constant value and you have to differentiate with respect to x. So what will this be? One cos y plus y. sin y. Sin y, right? So be very careful. You should not differentiate with respect to y. Y is a constant. So think of this like, say, 30 degrees so or, or 30 pi radians, right? So this will be sin pi. So it is like sin pi into x. Sin pi is 0. So maybe, say, some sin 45 degrees. So this will be x pi root 2. So if you find the derivative with respect to x, it will just be 1 by root 2. Okay. See, y is fixed, right? So when you take partial derivative with respect to x, y is fixed. Now, what happens when you take the derivative with respect to y? x cos y. x cos y, right? So sin y, if you differentiate, it gives cos y. Now, notice that x is not going to vanish. OK, y, so here y, y square vanished. But here, it didn't vanish. OK, why, why is that? Because we are multiplying. multiplying. Correct, right? So usual rules of differentiation apply. You are multiplying something with the function, and that multiplier or coefficient will remain there, right? It won't vanish. Sir, can you explain the first one again? So you, you have x into some constant. Therefore, it's like y equal to, you can treat this as uh, so when y is fixed, this is something like f of x comma y is equal to mx form, right? Where m is sine y. So when you differentiate it with respect to x, you get just the coefficient m. Okay. Okay. So you can, of course, we can visualize this also. Let's do that. So you can. Uh, so let's look at what. So what x sine y, right? So this is x. OK, so x sine y looks like this. Now, it's actually nice to visualize this because we'll get an idea. So what is this telling us? The, the derivative of, first of all, let's look at what we mean when we say fx, right? So we are fixing y. So if we fix y, OK, if we fix the value of y, Let's fix it at y equal to 1. So what do you think will the, the resulting curve look like? So the intersection of these two surfaces, right? What will it look like? Can you imagine if you x sine y is the surface, the orange color surface that you see, and I'm there's a plane passing through y equal to 1. That is not visible. It's a line, sir. Oh, I'm very sorry. I am sharing a. I'm sharing, sharing a wrong tab. Okay. Yeah. So this is the orange color curve. This is x sine y. And yeah. So yeah, someone told me that it's a line. Kind so that is correct. Kind of. So let's intersect this. Plane and that, uh, sine, uh, x All right. So it's a plane. You are intersecting it with x sine y surface. So you end up with a line. Okay. And are you all able to see the line? That yes. is there here, right? So this is yes. expected because what is what is this? So if you fix sine y, this is just the sine y just becomes a constant. Constant, right? It's just the slope of this line f of x comma y now. 
right now if you think about taking the derivative of that that function it will just be the the slope term right m sin y okay i did, did you all get that part how this yeah. came about yes sir okay now as you keep changing the value of y you will get different slopes so now let's look at maybe a y equal to 2 right so y equal to 2 will be some other line now if you intersect y equal to 2 and this curve the surface so we get another line or okay i think again I, I should have drawn it slightly before maybe y equal to minus 1 would have that will help me yeah so do you notice that you get two different lines so i'll what i'll do is yeah so this is the curve and you have two lines which are having different slopes. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, so this slope will yes. be determined by the value of y. So sine y will give you what this value is. Okay, this is the partial derivative with respect to x. Now, what we'll do is uh, let's do the other part also. Let's uh, okay, I'll delete the whole thing. So I start so this is x sin y okay so x sin y is there and then we need no we need to fix x so if you fix let's say x equal to one and you try to see what it looks like what do you think it will look like the resulting curve x sin y with intersection with x equal to one it will be a curve sir. sin y curve Curve, yeah exactly right it will be the sinusoidal curve so now, if we zoom out a bit, you will see the entire curve coming up, right? So this is, uh, yeah. So that that's how it look like. Now this is x sine y. So now, if you if you notice the partial derivative of that curve will naturally be some constant into the cosine curve, right? I'm 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 saying constant because for now we have kept x to be constant, right? So that's what you get, right? Is this clear? The x sine y example. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, but sir. No, yeah. So one point you have to remember: see, while you are differentiating, you kept x constant. But after once you differentiate, this is an entirely new multivariable function that you end up with. Okay, so that is something important. So this is a function. Finally, this is also a function. So the partial derivative with respect to y is a multivariable function scalar valued multivariable function that will change depending on the value the, it will take different values depending on what you give for x and y okay so x doesn't always remain a constant please make a note of that okay so if no if you can actually do one step more you can differentiate this once again you can treat this these are called higher order derivatives right just like you have a d square f by dx or f double prime of x you can find out a double partial der derivative so we will discuss that in next week i think so at that point you must remember that x is no longer a constant okay so is that idea clear to everyone yes okay so this is a function in itself when you took the intersection uh uh, whichever the sine uh, curve we got, it was sine x, sine y, or that uh, this x cos y. Uh, that was x. That was sine y. Okay, that was just something into sine y. I was not discussing the derivatives there, right? Partial derivatives. They were just what happens if you slice the curve along two planes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now that you have to find slope to that particular. Uh, you have to find the slope at some point for that particular curve that will give you the derivatives partial derivatives okay sir sir can you solve the first one using that uh, product rule um here we don't need right the product rule because it's like it's of the form say g of x into h of y right so this is like if you take the partial derivatives it will be g prime of x h of y or g of x into h prime of y it will be only one of these two right product rule comes in only when you have say 
g of x into h of x and then you have to find out what happens right so we'll come to the product rule in a, in a minute or the quotient rule okay so this here it's not it's not needed i hope you got that point okay uh, with respect to y, partial differentiation is uh, also a function, you say? Correct, yeah. So the partial derivative is also a function. That's the point you have to remember. It's, uh, okay, the so you, see, the, when we say x is fixed, okay, what we mean is for obtaining the value of fx of x, comma y, you treat as though y is fixed. Okay, as though so this the the phrase that we use right is important. Once you get hold of this derivative sine y. Okay, now here of course no x occurs. So let me take this example. So here you differentiate you when you find the partial derivative you you temporarily fix the value of x to some constant. Okay, that's how you get hold of the derivative. But once you get the derivative x is no longer fixed okay you can't treat x as a constant so depending on different values of x and y this function will take different values is that idea clear so can you please repeat yes. the last question i didn't understand uh, which part so the last part okay so see what we are doing is uh, if you we, we are trying to find out the rate of change of the function at say some point a comma b so I, I ideally want to find at a comma b how much does the function change along the y-axis right this is what I want to find so how do I do this I I fix the value of x so first I move by some distance along the y-axis and I fix the value of x. So x is now fixed at a, and I only move the y, y coordinate. Okay, this is what the partial derivative of f with respect to y is. Is that is this clear? Yes. Okay, now this is for a particular point a comma b. Okay, so here a and b are specific values. So a could be 2, b could be 5. Okay, now if you keep changing a and b. Okay, you could keep changing a and b you will end up with okay sorry this is not so this is the limit i have missed the limit so the limit h tending to zero of this this is the partial derivative now if you keep changing a and b you can get the partial derivatives at different parts of the domain right so i am justified in calling in defining a function called fy of x comma y so so this will give me the partial derivative at any point x comma y in the domain provided it exists okay that's that is what i'm calling as x cos y here and that will follow a function sir yeah that is a function okay that is a function so if you actually compute compute this now in fact if you want we can let's do this from first principles so let's see what this is let's say this is limit Okay, this is let me do this from scratch if this formula is not clear let me know because this formula is important this is from is the first principles formula okay we are we want to find the rate of change of f the function f at the point a comma b but then since this is since there are infinitely many directions, we are only interested in one direction along the y-axis. Okay, now I can talk about this rate of change, and that rate of change is this. Okay, now what we do is if plug in the values, so this is limit h tending to zero of f of a, a comma b plus h. So f of x comma y is x sine y. So this becomes a sine b plus h is that correct yes sir. Yeah. Okay. this is sine of a comma b uh, sorry what am i saying a 
x sin a sin b right okay is this numerator correct yes sir okay by, by h now this is the limit okay so let's go down now this is limit h tends to 0 and uh, what you have is you can uh, expand this sign right so this uh, have you been taught this sine of a plus b formula yes, yes. Sir. okay yes, sir. so this is what this is sine b sorry some random symbols are coming up yeah sine b cosine h correct yes plus cos h cos cos b sine h is that correct yes okay minus a sine b by h now all this is the limit is still holding on the left on the on this expression right so this is still limit h tending to zero so what will this be this will be um, you will have h here this will be a sine b cos h plus okay so i'll i'll separate this plus you have a a cos b sine h okay so this is a cos b sin h now by h so this is a safe thing to have now minus a sin b is not a safe thing to have separately so this has to be actually i'll take this a sin b common so this becomes cos h minus 1 by h is that correct yes sir yes sir okay right so now we are so far so good so what happens now is okay so 1 minus cos h is what? 2 sin two square, h, square h, by h by 2. Correct, right? Very good. So someone remembers that. You were taught that also. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is a sin b. Now this is uh, 2 sin square h by 2 okay, divided by h plus now this this limit is what sin h by h becomes one one right so that entire thing i can take out of the limit and write it down as a cos b a cos b right so that's that evaluates to a cos b so i know i no need to worry about this limit so what can we do here multiply and divide by something yes h by 4 uh, by 4 4 right uh, so we can multiply and divide by h here. So h by 2, right? So if you multiply by h by 2, OK, so I have multiplied the denominator by h by 2. Sorry, correct. Uh, so this is just h square by 4, correct? Yeah. Sorry, h h by 4, right? Yes, sir. h by 2 will itself give me h. h, h by 2, sorry, 2. Uh, no, it's no, no, it's squared. It's squared from it's squared. Yes, sir, it's all right. Okay. Correct, right? No, okay. So now this whole thing will be what? Sin h. So this the h is there here. So this will become one and this will become zero, right. right? Yeah, yes, sir, zero. Okay, so this whole limit will therefore collapse into a cos b. Do you all agree? Yes, sir. Okay, so the partial derivative of y at the point a comma b along the y-axis is a cos b. Now, a and b can be allowed to vary is what I'm trying to say. So instead of having it at a particular point a comma b, in general, if, if you replace a with x and y, b with y, this becomes x cos y, Okay, which is what we obtained here without doing all this first principles business, we obtain x cos y. Now, what I'm trying to say is fy of x comma y is a multi, is again, a multivariable function. OK, so even though we fixed x temporarily to obtain x cos y, you should not assume that x remains fixed forever. OK, that is just to obtain the derivative, partial derivative. So we can again find a partial derivative of this function. Correct, you are right. So you can again do so. They are called partial derivatives of just like you have d square f by dx square, right? F yes, double sir. prime of x, you can find partial derivatives of second order. So that will be 
so this will be uh, you call it so this you call do f by do x right so that you will call do square f just like d d square f you will call this uh, or del square f by del x square okay you can do that no you can you can also do mixed partial derivatives for example you can do f y x so something like so you have f y f y is a function so i can do f y y i can take f y and then take the derivative with x i can do f of x yeah, so f x and then i can take y and then i can do f x x right so what does this mean all this means uh, these are all partial derivatives of higher order so these are all first order derivatives order means how many times you are differentiating okay so these are all second order derivatives so these are second order because you differentiate it twice okay so if you do f y y for example so this will be dis discussed in next week i think but let's just go and do it so if you do f y y of x comma y what will you get minus x sin x minus x sin y right so mm -hmm. you fix again you temporarily think of x as a constant differentiate with respect to y so you will get minus x sin y likewise you can do you can do a mixed partial derivative right so you could do f y x that is first do with respect to y then do with respect to x so what will you get cos y cos y cos y right so now there is another uh, interesting thing now you can ask this question is f x y the same as f sir how are we applying the formula in this i'm not getting how did we arrive on cos y uh, because we fixed x uh, we differentiated with respect to x right so partial derivative of this function with respect to x so you treat y as a constant therefore you get cos y right so that is so x cos y you take the derivative with respect to x sorry can you just write it and show how is it done uh so x cos y you want to take the derivative with respect to x partial derivative therefore you fix y and then you treat it as a function of x so you end up with cos y right x becomes one it's so like again the same thing constant times x something value two or three and then okay is this clear now so sir if x is 2 it will become 2 cos y ah uh, if x is 2 it will be cos y right so if you are talking about f y x it will in this case it doesn't even depend on x yes sir okay so see the idea is when you want to differentiate something with respect to x partially right that means you have to fix the other variables and then treat it as a function of x so this is just a straight line passing through the origin y equal to mx and therefore you get m when you differentiate with respect to x all right yes, so sir. this uh, mixed partial derivatives we will see now we will also see when this this holds right when can we say that the uh, order of differentiation doesn't matter fx y equal to f y of f y uh, so this is not always true so this is true yeah. for some well behaved functions which we will see so they are functions uh, of a particular nature which are going to have this property okay so anyway this this comes only next week so let's okay so if you want to do this partial derivative for something like this right so complex looking function now let's try to find uh, what the derivative of this will be for all points other than 0 0 right 0 0 is not even in the domain so it there's no point talking about continuity and differentiability at 0 0 because it's not there in the domain so for all other points this is a well behaved function okay do you agree it's like 
so what do you mean by well behaved like uh, can we can use that uh, the trick mm, the shortcut method you are saying in every yeah. function uh sorry this should be y square i think yeah so the shortcut that i mentioned right yes, is sir. safe to apply for functions which are not going to have like let's say zero in the denominator or which are not going to have let's say some something that runs off to infinity in the denominator so for these functions you can directly find the derivative using the method i mentioned okay okay there are some functions which are tricky to work with there you have to be careful okay so you want to find out the partial derivative of this function with respect to x so what will you do here we'll fix uh, y and then apply uh, quotient rule here correct yeah you have to apply the quotient rule fixing y so this denominator becomes x square plus y square whole square right so that we'll first fix that and then it is denominator into der derivative of the numerator what is the derivative of numerator partial so remember partial derivative y. this is just y minus the numerator into derivative of the denominator with respect to x 2x 2x it's 2x right so that is all there is to this so now you can simplify this this will become some expression of some rational expression right so likewise you can do for sir in denominator we are in taking derivative that is why it is just square normally uh yeah there's no derivative in denominator right it's just yeah. the okay sir okay so this is uh, partial derivatives a very important concept in uh, this part of the course okay okay so just give me two two to three minutes and we will resume okay can someone explain how do we get uh, x cos y the derivative in terms of x as cos y
I'm sorry. Yeah, so. Yeah, where uh, did we leave? Direct, so we are. We have seen till partial derivatives. So now, you know, we are going to look at this concept called directional derivative. So slightly trickier than partial derivatives. Okay. So give me a second. So what is the u may I know? Uh, u 1 by root 2 1 1. What is uh, yeah? I'll I'll come to that right. So I'll come to what is the idea of a directional derivative. So x plus x y minus two y square. That's the function. Okay. So this is how it looks like. So it looks like the saddle of a horse. If you have seen horse's saddle, now x plus x y minus 2 y square and uh, okay right so i hope you're all able to see the function yes okay yes, so let's look at few directions now the direction that we have seen so far is either parallel to the x-axis so some plane parallel to the x-axis or y-axis so if you look at x-axis, it looks like this. The resulting curve, right? The intersection will look like this. So, so this is one one direction. Okay. So that is one direction, and you have this black color curve. I hope you're all able to see, right? This is when you cut it along x-axis. Now let's do y-axis, right? So. Now, if you slice it out, slice it along the y-axis, and again, if you take the intersection, it looks like this. Okay. Now, interestingly, it it turns out to be a line. Okay. One is a parabola or quadratic curve. Another one is a line. Now, what we'll do is we'll not stop here. So, if you can find the rate of change of a function along x equal to along the x-axis or the y-axis, nothing stops us from finding the rate of change of the function along some other direction also right let's say x equal to y so if you plot x equal to y you will end up with another plane now we can ask what happens to uh, this so intersect these two okay, did we end up with the intersection or think we didn't right we still have we still have only two or no we have right. also yeah. looking like parabola two parabola and a straight line ah okay so what we'll now do is we we'll, can hide the previous one sir it will be more clear right so let's let's in fact hide the surface to start with uh how do we hide the surface alone Okay, right. So I have hidden the surface because all the information needed is there in these three planes, right? Whatever we are interested in. So this is one line. Okay. Now this is the this line will tell us about the rate of change of y along the x-axis, correct? Yes. Okay. Now if you go back to this plane, this parabola, yeah. So as you said, I think it's better to hide. It's better to hide uh, x equal to 0. No, which one are, are we done with? So y equal to 0, we are I done with. Zero. So we are. I'll just hide that. And uh, also this one. OK. Right now, I'm left with. So I'll hide x equal to y also for now, so that we end up with this one. Right now, now this is what? The intersection of the curve the surface with 
x equal to 0, right? Now that gives us the rate of change of f at the point 0, 0 along y axis, the y -axis right? So this is what? Partial derivative with respect to y. y, right? Of course. So when I say partial derivative with respect to y, I'm thinking about particular point in mind. So, so I've taken the 0, 0 point and then I've cut the surface with a plane x equal to 0 and that is how we come across this right so so far these are the two directions we know x axis y axis what happens to the functions value now what we'll do is there's no nothing special about these two directions right so we can also look at what happens to the function along other direction so if you look at the direction uh no this is not this is Now, if you look at the direction x equal to y, okay, along x equal to y, so I, some, I accidentally triggered something else also. What is that I triggered? Okay, anyway, uh, so along the y axis uh, intersection, you have triggered this one, is it? The line, the line along the y, along the y axis. Uh, but now it's gone, now it's gone, now it's gone. Ah, okay, right. So, see, this is what. This is what happens to the function along the x equal to y direction. Okay, so along x equal to y, notice that I have sliced the surface with a plane. So x equal to y is again a plane. So this may, if it, I hope it's clear why x equal to y is a plane, right? I am allowing z to be anything. Yes. Sir. Okay. Now this is what this this particular curve will tell you how the function is changing along a particular line in this case x equal to y is the is the direction we are interested in so this is what will take us to the idea of directional derivative right so i'll go back now we we were looking at this function and i want to find out the rate of change of the function at this point along the direction one comma one okay so we are interested in in the rate of change of f of x comma y at the point a comma b along the direction u is this idea clear sir we can think of that plane as rotated uh, by some degree y x plane or x y plane we have rotated in that direction uh, yes, in a sense, yes, you will you will get this this particular direction by rotating that plane. Uh, but think about more complex planes, right? Yeah, yeah, you, you are right. So you, you can rotate them also, right? So you can rotate any. You can obtain any plane passing through a vector by rotating one of these planes, right? So you can think about it that way. But is this idea clear? We are we are changing the function along a particular curve now, so along a particular direction. We are fixing x or y, and then we are rotating that along that point. Yeah. So see here, it's no longer fixing x and y, right? You are fixing a direction, All right? So you are fixing the direction. Both x and y. Yeah. So both x and y are going to vary. Okay. Now, so it's the same idea of partial derivatives, but then in partial derivatives, you had only x-axis and y-axis. You could only move along x-axis and y-axis. Now what we are telling you is you can move along this direction, particular direction u. Okay, and we are calling this derivative f u of x comma y. So notice similarities. So we were calling this fx and fy. Now we are calling it f u. Okay, in fact, if you are if you think about it, if I move along the direction 1 comma 0, right? What will this be equal to? Uh, y, f y of x comma y. Sorry, f x of x comma y. F x, right? So this is f x of x comma y. Likewise, if I move along the direction zero comma one. No, sir, it should be f y, right? Because we are fixing x. Uh, no, so see, this, this means we are moving along the x axis, right? So this this is the direction of motion. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. So. 
this is the partial derivative so this is f y you are you all able to see this no so can i explain this again uh okay so see what are we doing is as follows right you are having so you are having this original function okay now this is the function and uh, earlier what we were doing we were trying to find out how fast f is changing along the point a comma b in a, in a particular direction along the x axis or y axis but yes. there is nothing so great or special about that direction we could think of other directions also right now we are considering the direction x equal to y so if you notice this is x axis this is y axis so it's like the 45 degree direction right line 45 degree line so along that line if you think about what the function looks like it looks like this okay you are only allowed to move along that line so if you move along that line the function will look like this parabola okay now you are asking how fast does this function change at a particular point along this line along the y equal to x plane no sir y equal to x correct y equal to x is a plane but so sir y is equal to x is a line na no? no y equal to x in is a plane but then if you think about in 3d in, in 3d it's a plane but then if you are asking about uh, if you are talking yes. about the direction in the domain right see the domain is what you go back so this the domain of what is the domain of f it's an xy plane r2 xy yeah it's the xy plane or r2 right so so we are interested in so i can only move along Direction in the xy plane, right? So therefore, when you say what is the rate of change of f along a particular direction, you talk about a vector. So we are we are talking about direction along a vector, and a vector is a line in R two. Okay, so I'll just make the make a note. The vector u denotes the direction of motion, right? and uh, this is geometrically a line in the xy plane okay now if you are if you visualize this we are having z axis right so this becomes that xy the the line along with the plane that is erected on top of that line do you see that so this is the this is the x equal to so this is the u vector that i was talking about 1 comma 1 vector okay that 1 comma 1 vector will be a line passing through the origin on the xy plane but i am not just interested in that line right i am interested in the value of the function along that line therefore you look at the z axis also so therefore it becomes a plane so blue reason no it is the aqua or green plane that is cutting yes. across the surface okay the so dotted so line is what you are interested in the whole green that plane is in the direction of you that whole line is the domain and when we are intersecting it with this function we are getting uh, a plane as a uh, intersection and that plane has a parabola which is the intersection correct yeah that parabola lies in that plane okay that plane is actually not so important what is important is the direction of motion which is 1 comma 1 in this case and the resulting parabola you can think of it as we are slicing a 3d uh, version of that and we are getting that cross section right so, yeah okay so is this clear or so it, it with practice this will become more clear right? so yes, may seem clear. you know okay now what is if what is the rate of change of f along this direction 1 comma 1 that is what we need to find okay so the way it is defined is again you the same so 
we only know one thing about derivatives that is derivatives of single variable functions okay everything about multivariable functions is based on that one idea of converting this multivariable case into some single variable function okay by fixing the direction you are actually doing that so if you move some h distance along this direction how much will the function change okay so you the, the direction is what u is given by u1 comma some u2 right so this is the direction in this case it's 1 comma 1 so this is important it's this should be a unit vector okay since so u 2u 3u 4u all of them point in the same direction right so you must not there will be too much ambiguity therefore what we do is whenever we talk about directional derivative we fix a unit vector in some direction okay is this uh, clear why we are talking about the unit vector yes sir okay so all all multiples of u are going to be pointing in the same direction so it is enough if we talk about the it's unit like vector the normal basis of that plane in some sense maybe ortho normal basis uh... we can like an analogy we can say not exactly ah uh, okay okay so now we are moving along u so how much will the function change so the function's value at at a comma b right so we are remember we are trying to find the this is what we are trying to find so in fact let me move this here this is what we are trying to find we are interested in rate of change of f at a comma b along the direction u equal to u1 comma u2 so this is u1 comma u2 okay and uh, now let's see so f is at the point a comma b it is so this is a comma b right let's do for a specific point so at a comma b the value of f is this now by moving some h distance along the vector u what does f become a plus h and b plus h okay, it becomes a plus you are moving along u so it becomes h times u1 u1 comma b plus h times u2 okay so remember this so you, you must go back to the plane again you have a vector a comma b okay and you are moving h distance h units along u1 comma u2 therefore you end up with you end up at, at the point h a plus h u1 comma b plus h u2 so is this clear what happens that is why u1 u2 yes. were unit vectors uh right so it's a convention that is useful for us right if you take a step you take h units along the direction u starting from a comma b you will end up at at the point a plus h u h u 1 comma b plus h u 2 okay i hope this is clear to everyone yes sir. okay so now what is f u of a comma b it is the rate of change of so f u comma f u of a comma b is the rate of change of f at the point a comma b again i'm missing the limits okay it's very important just this ratio is nothing so this limit is what matters right it's the rate of change of f at the point a comma b in the direction of the unit vector u equal to u1 comma u2 Okay, now notice that if you if you plug in if you set u1 equal to 1 and u2 equal to 0 this definition will turn out to be the one for fx of a comma b okay and if you set so this is something that we just discussed right so if, if u of a comma b will become fx of a comma b likewise if you set 
the other one to be one and this to be zero, you'll get FY. Okay, is this idea clear? The partial, the yeah. directional derivative? Sir, this question didn't mention that equation x equal to y. Oh, that was there just for visualization, right? x equal to uh right yeah that is in fact this question we, this is what we were discussing there right so we have to find out the directional derivative of f at 2 comma 3 along 1 1 1 comma 1 by root 2 so this is a unit vector so if u is given as a x comma y of some equation then uh, we have to get the values basis get the values by so u would be just a vector or it can also be a line in that form x equal to y or some line. Mm, you can, they can also give u in the form of a line. So they could give you, u is a unit vector along the line y equal to x. They could give you give it to you in that form also. So in that case, you have to construct the vector, unit vector. Okay. So right, here so, a comma b will gonna be fixed now. It yeah, here a comma b is fixed. So you want to find out how fast the function is changing at two comma three along one one by root two one comma one. Okay, so this is you have to apply first principle. So this is f of u comma b. If if u comma sorry f u of two comma three is the limit as h tends to zero of what of f of two plus 1 by root 2. Okay, so this is uh, this is the 1 by root 2 is the step. So h is the step size, and 1 by root 2 is the direction, right? So component along the direction, and this is 1 plus h by root 2. So 3, Oh, sorry, this is three three plus correct. Yeah. Okay, so let me. This is the new function's new value after moving by some distance h along the line one by root two comma one by root two. Now, what is the original value of the function? F two of two comma three. Right now, you have to evaluate this limit. That is all there is to it. So we'll do it now. So this is uh, h tending to zero. Now, there's no other go but to plug the value inside and uh, do it. OK, so this is what 2 plus. So I'm just multiplying, right? So you have 2 plus h by root 2. That is the x part plus x times y, right? So if you multiply this into this, you'll get 6 plus h square by 2, right? Plus the xy term, which is. 5 5h by root 2 correct yes. minus 2y square so that is again some complicated thing so this is like 2 plus 2 into 9 plus h square by 2 plus 6 6h six by root 2 is that correct So can you can someone verify if all this is correct? So basically, I'm plugging in this into f of x comma y. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what we can do is notice that uh, wherever there is h square, you can just get away with that will become 0, right? Because h square by h will, the limit will be 0. OK, so we have to group terms. So, that, so yeah. So you did not subtract f. So minus f 2, comma 3, that also we have to write, right? Uh, that is correct, yeah. So, OK, so what was this that I come to? This is minus 2 y square, OK. So minus okay, 2, comma 3, what will that be? This will be? Minus, okay, so this will be 2 plus 6 minus 2 into 18, is it? It's 18. 18. Okay, now let's simplify this quickly. So this is, okay, that is, this will get cancelled here, right? So let's, this becomes what? 
minus ten. Minus this whole 10. thing becomes ten, is it? Plus ten. Yes, sir. Yes. Plus 10. Okay, right. So now, now let's start simplifying. Now you have a uh, two plus six, eight, and then minus minus ninety, minus eighteen, right? So this becomes minus ten, correct? Yes. Okay. Now this minus ten and this plus ten are going to get cancelled. So I'm, I'm, so I'll just not have that there. So you have a uh, h by root two, and you have a five h by root two. So that becomes six h by root two. And you have a h square by two, and then you have minus two h square by two. So this becomes minus h square by two. Is that correct? Yes. And then you have a minus twelve h by root two. So that becomes minus, minus six, six, by six h by root two. And you have a h here. So now the nice part is this will become limit h tending to zero. Of the fractions you can remove. So this is minus six by root two, minus six by root two, and zero. Minus yeah. So why right. is this h square right to is left? H by two. Uh, that it is. It will get cancelled, no? There is a minus two h square by two, right? So there is. So two and eventually two. it doesn't matter. You're right. So eventually it'll it'll get it'll go away. So it'll just be minus six by root two. Yes. Okay. So this again, I'm taking this from one of the activity questions. So if you go back, you will notice. So this is what this is the rate of change of the function along one comma one. So Just give me a second. This this answer turned out to be something else. Maybe I'm missing. This answer was uh, minus three or something. Then I'm getting. We can sir do sir minus three. So we can convert it in. Ah okay okay right you are right. So this was this is actually is what minus three root two right? Yes sir. So yeah this is correct yeah no minus three. So the question asked. The directional derivatives of the form something into root two. So what is that something? That was the question. So the something is minus three. Okay, right. So what have we found out? We have found out the following. See, this is what geometrically this means. Let's take the function again. I'll write down the description. So if we move a very small distance along the vector one comma one. Okay, by root two. Okay, if I move a very small distance along the vector one comma one by root two, the function's value changes by minus three root two. So, I, so I'll, I'll just put it this way. So, if we move by a very small distance, say h units, okay, along this vector, the function's value changes by Minus three root two times h, okay, approximately. Okay, so this is what we call rate of change, right? So this by this will give you the rate of change, and the rate of change is minus three root two. So do you understand what this means geometrically? Yes. Okay, so small movement along this direct along this direction will result in the function's value decreasing. Actually, in this case, so the function's value will go down. How fast will it go down? It will go down in this as fast as this, right? So, so why okay, have so, we multiplied h? Uh, so I multiplied by h because I I mentioned the functions. So I I mentioned the functions value changes by something, right? So if you want to call it the rate of change, then it will be minus three root. The rate of change of f is three root two, right? Minus three root two. But if you are asking for exact uh, the approximate amount by which it changes, it is this into h, right? So is that fine with everyone? Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, so it's like the distance by time, right? So where do we get these? Uh, this rate of change of terminology comes from physics, right? So If you are moving at 
say 10 meters per second so you're moving at 10 meters per second and uh, if you in, in a small time interval of 0.1 seconds how much will you move right one meter right yes right that's exactly what we are saying here right if you move along this direction by some h h meters sorry for h so you can think of h in terms of seconds right if you move for h seconds along this direction then where will you be so something like that you can take that analogy and see if that helps so one okay, so this minus root uh, this is uh, per unit change can we say and this is yeah per this is minus 3 root 2 is the Sir, this changes just around that point one comma one, right? No. Yeah, exactly. This is, in fact, around around the point, at Old the point one comma one, along a particular direction, right? So when you come to multivariable calculus, right, the direction becomes important because there are infinitely many directions. So you can't talk about the rate of change in general. You can only talk about rate of change at a point along a direction. It could be x-axis, y-axis, or any other direction. Sir, that Every point, point is one comma one, or the direction is one comma one. The point is two comma three. The direction is one comma one. Okay. So that means, sir, rate of change will be different for every direction, right? Every could, for every point. Correct. It could change depending on the point and the direction. Uh, and if you're calculating along a different vector, then we have to consider the norm of it, right? Again, like when we are. Uh, yeah, so if you are, con yeah. Even in, if if the question says along the vector one comma one, then you have to normalize it and make it unit norm, right? So you should always compute it along the unit. Okay. So that we can change that to three point to like say four five, and we still get this form. Basically, you're generalizing along the unit uh, with the unit norm, and then we are saying, as like you said, minus three root two h. So, so that many times it will change. Is it? But that yeah, so minus three root two is fixed for two three. It will be different for different points. Uh, yeah. So the minus three root two is for one comma one along one comma one at the point two comma three. Right. So it could be something else for some other point and some other direction. In fact, it could be different for the same point but different direction right so that's the whole point of what? can we say vice versa uh, which is different point and same direction different point same direction yeah so that's that's also there right so if you consider a different point same direction the function could behave differently there so a lot depends on we need These to take account the whole three D plane there. Yeah. For this moment. Yeah. Okay. So this is what this is uh, directional derivative. Now there are some examples, few more examples which are similar. You have to go through. So the first principles approach is there. There is a way to get around the first principles approach, but for that uh, you need to know few more things. So. Okay, what so should we do? Both x and y are given, then we have to go through first principle. X and y. Like in case in u, both coordinates are given, u1 and u2. Yeah. So if you are talking about a direction other than x and y, x-axis and y-axis, you it's a bit difficult. So you have to because principle is the only method not necessary if the function is well behaved there is something called the there's a different approach right which will help you so i'll maybe i'll introduce you to that approach so that that will at least complete the directional derivative and the gradient uh, sorry the partial derivative part so what will remain is only limits and continuity so there is this concept called gradient okay so gradient is an extremely important concept in in the entire program Okay, so I'm not, this is not mere hyperbole, I'm not exaggerating, but if you are interested in the DS uh, data science diploma and uh, the degree level, you need to know what the gradient is, right? So this is one of the most important concepts 
that you will keep seeing in every other machine learning course. But then it's very simple. So it's called uh, the no notation for it is NABLA. Okay, so this Greek letter is NABLA and f of x comma y, right? So it, it's nothing but a vector of partial derivatives of the function. That is all there is to it. Okay, so the gradient of a function at a point is a vector of partial derivatives, right? So the gradient of a function at a point is a vector of That is all there is to the gradient. So now for this particular function, you can compute what this vector is going to be. You can it's quite simple here, right? It's what is this vector? First component is 2x because partial derivative with respect to x is 2x. Second component is 2y. Okay, this is a vector valued multivariable function. Okay, so the gradient itself, if you notice, is a function. Okay, this is itself a function. Sorry, this is itself a function. It's a vector value multivariable. Okay, why is it multivariable function? Because it takes x and y as input. Why is it vector valued? Because it's a vector of partial derivatives. So can we think of it like as the terrain is given of a surface? Mm. <clears throat> so what the gradient gives you is, is something very powerful. What it's telling you is, if you know what happens to if you know how, how the terrain looks like along the x-axis and y-axis, then you can kind of figure out how it looks like along any other direction. OK, so before I go there, is the, at least formula-wise, is the idea of a gradient clear? You just have yes. to compute partial derivatives and put it inside a vector. So let's take this case. So this is, can you tell me how many components this vector will have? Three. Three components. Three. What will be the first component? F sub x, x. Y. Okay. Eight. This is fx, right? This is fx of x, y, z. We will read it as fx only, right? Or f subscript x. Uh, whichever way, so like ideally, it, we should, you should call this a del f by del x, right? Where you have the partial derivative symbol, but for convenience, we are calling it fx, f, x, y, and fz. So, so this is what? Can you now tell me what the first component will be? 8x. 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 8y. 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 8
exist, right? If both the uh, all partial derivatives, right? So in this case, there are only two fx, fy, and are continuous, right? So continuity is very similar to what we have seen so far. So it, like the one variable case. So if the partial derivatives at a a comma b exist and are continuous, then the directional derivative along any unit vector u okay so along any unit vector u is given by this gradient of x if, if evaluated at a comma b dot product of the gradient with respect to u so this is a few Okay, so I, 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 this notation is a bit tricky. I think this is called du in the lectures, but I don't know. When I upload the notes, I will fix it. But uh, if you are watching this session uh, again, or if you happen to go back and revise, please be careful about the notation. Okay, so I might have messed up the notation here. So the idea is you have. Let's let's look at f of x comma y, right? So this is. A well behaved function because it's it's made up of polynomials so you can safely assume that the gradients uh, the the partial derivatives are going to be continuous right so what are the partial derivatives here what is uh, fx uh, fx for this function 1 plus y y minus okay y 1 plus y and x minus 4 y. x minus yeah x minus 4y okay this is the partial derivative now if you look at the unit vector it's 1 by root 2 comma 1 1 right so the claim is instead of going through the first principles way you can find out f u of a comma b by computing f of a comma b and taking the dot product of that with u okay so let's first compute i'm not, i'm not going to write this as a vector in in this form form of a row vector right so 1 plus y is what 1 plus so let me change this to 2 comma 3 okay so 1 plus y is 4 4 comma 1 minus sorry 2 minus 12 is minus 10, right? Minus, yes. So this is the gradient. Okay, this is the gradient. This is the first vector. You are taking the dot product of this with 1 by root 2, comma 1 by root. 1 by root 2, comma 1, comma 1. So this will become what? This 1 by root 2, we can keep common notes out there. 4 minus 10. 4 minus 10. 4 minus 10, which is minus 6. Okay, so yeah. recall that this is the same thing that we so this is minus three root two. This is what we got some time back, right? So where did we? We yeah, minus three root two, right? So we did this from first principles, but then if your function is well behaved, meaning if the partial derivatives exist and are continuous, right? This is the important point. They should exist, of course. If they don't exist, then the directional derivative there's no point talking about it so if the partial derivatives exist and are continuous then you can find this directional derivative along any unit vector using this simple dot product okay using the dot product of the gradient with the unit vector sir okay, can so we say other way if this thing exists the bottom and then it's a partial and and it's continuous no. And... no this is like the idea of necessary and sufficient conditions are there, right? So you can't say that if this happens, so at least I am not aware of, of that. So there's only one directional implication so far, okay? I will check with this, uh, check this point that you have mentioned, whether we have a, there is an implication in the other direction, but uh, at present, I think it is not there, but I need to check. Okay, in the lectures, sir would have mentioned last slide of uh, the last lecture i think 
please go through that now we don't have time to discuss this but uh, this is an example of when you can't apply this rule the rule that i just mentioned right so you can't apply this for this particular case because the partial derivatives are in fact this function is not even continuous at zero zero therefore you can't really talk about partial derivatives for, for this function okay so so we can say for piecewise function it will never we can do it in first principle method but not in that we can't do that first also right because it is not continuous so see piecewise function doesn't mean that it's not continuous right so there could be piecewise functions which are continuous also yes and uh, in that case we don't have a problem right where the partial derivatives could be continuous so this is the only so we only yeah we have to check right only criterion is partial derivatives should exist and they should be continuous see the power of this theorem is this is what we are actually why is this theorem useful it's useful because if we know how fast function is changing along two directions then we we can compute how fast it will change in any other direction okay this, so this is powerful right because all that i need to know is how fast it changes along x axis and y axis that will give me complete information about how fast it's going to change along any other direction okay that is why this theorem is powerful but for for it to be applied you are your partial derivatives have to be continuous so there's that extra catch is added sir it is like we are finding x and y speed uh, in physics like it was there right we know the x speed and y speed then we can find that parabola speed and like direction of it ah uh, yes something like that yeah okay so i have not covered the limits and continuity part so i think tomorrow tonight tonight i'll request tonight there's another session right so uh, i'll request them to the ts to go over this but here also again you have to the main idea is the direction matters right so when you are talking about limits the direction matters a lot so which direction are you approaching the function from okay so yeah so that's all i have for today uh, for this session sir for tomorrow's activity session this will be discussed or tonight ta session tonight ta session i'll request them to discuss this i'll, I'll ask them to start from limits and continuity okay sir okay, sir can you yeah. tell what is used in data science uh, this one this is used everywhere so for example all your neural networks if you know what neural networks are what which powers this chat gpt and all that they use gradients everywhere so to learn the parameters there is a algorithm called gradient descent okay so gradient descent is a technique to optimize functions and gradient descent is like the power horse of or the work horse of modern uh, machine learning okay so without gradient descent nothing would be possible so in order to use this gradient descent uh, method you need the gradients so okay. uh, given the importance of this week so with respect to the entire course so can you please request for an extension at least this friday okay so i will ask i will but i've already been informed that uh, this is a hard deadline so so because uh, every week there has been an extension so I, it becomes I, Uh, it's, it's an expectation among all the students that there there will be an extension at least this Friday. Hmm. I understand. So, I if I were a student, I would also want an extension. But then, once you come to the other uh, side, um, things yeah. become different. Sir, the so, problem is that uh, the workload goes on to the next two week, next subsequent weeks also because we have to then uh, study these no, no, so to understand the. I, I agree. So you don't even need to explain the issue to me, right? So I know exactly what is happening, but then. So that is why I'm requesting yeah. you to take up the issue, please, sir. Uh, right. Yeah. So, but at the same time, there are few other things here, right? Which I'm. I'm also. 
witnessing a few other things uh, which the operational team has to do they are hard pressed for time so sir a day or two would also work this for i'm saying right so friday is normally they give to friday night friday but night so at least friday okay morning. so right i'll ask but i'm not sure i'll ask them and see okay sir thank you sir yeah sir what but was the name of the uh, reverse nine symbol which you use for derivative i forgot its name uh greek symbol for uh, gradient or other uh, no the other one sir like it was like opposite nine upside uh, partial nine. that is del ah, to del yeah. okay yes, sir, del. Slash, partial will work in latex if you are using latex slash backslash partial will work okay sir thank so, you partial direction derivative uh partial meaning so partial derivative right so along the x axis y axis sir how is this idea of derivative used in machine learning 